I joined the um, Marine Corps in June of 1941. Today is my birthday. Uh -huh. And today I am 83 years old. I was with the 4th Marine Division. The Fighting 4th. The Fighting 4th. I was a rifleman, primarily. That's the riflemen, of course, are the frontline boys. They're the ones that first make contact with the enemy. I went to Iwo Jima, I was uh, 19. Well, we were told when we were in our rest camp in the island of Maui, in the Hawaiian Islands, we were, t we were told that we were going to go into combat. Our, one of our uh, regimental commanders called us at a meeting and told us, look, you guys, you're not going back to the States. We, we have met, we we're already scheduled to go into an island, he says, which is gonna be far worse than any of the other battles we've been in. He said, uh, all I want you to do is just think that you're already dead and fight like demons. Of course, we didn't know the name of the island. It couldn't be told, it was supposed to be secret. Although many people had a pretty good idea. But we were told that it was gonna be a tough battle and uh, they told us right, it was. That night before, I don't believe I slept one wink, realizing, of course, what might happen the following day. But uh, I was definitely worried, of course, we all were. It's very scary, it really is. I don't know if there's any other word to say about it. It's very scary when you know, here you are and feeling good, feeling healthy, feeling young, and one day and the next day you may blown, be blown apart. Uh, we were in the first wave on the landing on Iwo Jima. We were in the first wave on all the landings, as a matter of fact. That's where they usually put riflemen in the first waves. And you never know what you're going to see when you hit that island, whether you're going to be rushed with Japanese running up there with their rifles and bayonets or whatever. But we could look for over and see the shelling that was taking place from the uh, Navy sh warships were firing into the island, laying down a fantastic barrage on Iwo. And everybody sort of thought that that would kill off just about two thirds or more of all the Japanese that would meet us on the beach. But the truth is the Japanese were not on the beach. They were down in their dugouts and they weren't even being hit by these shells. The Japanese were staying back, waiting for us to get in before they uh, actually at attacked us. Although they were landing mortar shells here and there all over the place and killing and wounding uh, Marines, the heavy fire hadn't yet come. And I turned around and looked back at that ship and I, there was holes through the stack. And I could see through the holes daylight, but there was something moving in the stack. And I turned around with my M1 rifle and emptied out a clip. And the guy beside me, the man beside me, Joe Javorsik, yelled at me, Ward, what are you shooting at? He said, the enemy's up there, not back there. I said, Joe, something moved in that stack. And I found out since then that there was an observer up in that stack and he was found strapped in up there, bringing fire down on us on the beach. So. Even though I didn't last long on the Battle of Iwo Jima, I'm glad I contributed somewhat to, to, to uh, doing my, what I was expected to do. We moved forward a little bit behind one of the, the last sand dunes. There was two sand dunes on, on Iwo on the beach. And uh, on the second one, and the Japanese let all hell loose on us. Uh, uh, we kind of crowded in there. We were crowding up on the beach a little then. We hadn't moved too far forward. And I can remember distinctly a man on my right side practically touching me and talking to me one minute, and the next minute he's, his innards are all over me. And the Javorsik, the one I told you was on my left-hand side, I saw him shaking and looked over and saw a big piece of metal sticking out of his jaw and I reached over and pulled it out of his jaw. Then when they started, this when I talked about the man that was right, right next to me got blown up. 
That's when they let down up with a, a terrific barrage of mortar shells. It, it was almost like rain coming down. I mean, every place you look, you see a puff of black smoke. Not the fire bombs that they show in the movies, but the uh, black smoke from the dust from a, a mortar shell. And uh, of course, sometimes you'd see in that smoke and dust and everything going up in the air, you'd see a human being flying through the air. And uh, men screaming, uh, one thing or another, guys running around with an arm blown off or a leg blown off. But they really let loose with a tremendous barrage there after the, but definitely after the first hour. I didn't last long. That's the whole thing about Several Iwo Jima. Days. I was just there uh, uh, 24 hours. I, uh, it was the roughest day of my life, the longest day of my life. It's, I, I guess it's, it felt more like a month although it was one day. I was very fortunate in many ways that I got wounded when I did. I got wounded the next morning, about three o'clock in the morning, and that was an experience in itself. I was laying there and, of course, the shells, as I say, were constantly falling, and screams were not un uncommon at all. A shell hit, I don't think it was more than three or four feet from me on my right side and blew my leg. I thought it blew it off, but it was a horrible pain, something that I had never experienced before or have experienced since then. But it was a horrible pain, and uh, of course, my first thought was for a corpsman to help me, so I called for a corpsman. I, I was told afterwards I should, have, should not have called for a corpsman, being that close to the front lines, and that's probably true. But, uh, but with that pain and all, you, you don't always think the way you should. But the uh, corpsman came over in the darkness, and he got within about, I'd say, seven or eight feet or ten feet from me and said, where are you? And when I raised my hand up trying to get his attention and yelled at him, a shell hit him, direct him, blew him, pieces of him at least, all over me and my friend that was next to me. He was wounded also. We started crawling, and I crawled until my elbows were raw almost from using my elbows to crawl. And suddenly somebody picked me up and put me on a stretcher. And they carried the stretcher a short distance and a shell hit in front of him and killed a man carrying the stretcher as if that should be enough right there. Sooner or later, somebody else picked up the stretcher and carried it down to the beach and dumped me off on the beach. Well, the beach, as I recall, and I could still see a little, with, especially with the lights from the star shells, that the beach was loaded with wounded and dying people. And as I was laying there, a corpsman, another corpsman, came over and pulled my leg down, straightened it out because the bones were sticking out. And he was put a, put a shot of morphine in me, which was fantastic. Took away that horrible pain. And he was put a tourniquet on my leg, which I know saved my life because I was bleeding pretty badly. I'd been bleeding for a couple hours by that time and probably had very little blood left in my system. But he, put a, he was putting the tourniquet on, he was over me when a shell hit there and killed him right on top of me. And I remember after he fell on me, I tried to move him off, but I had, didn't have the strength. My, it seemed like all the strength had left my body, I guess from the loss of blood. And I passed out. And as I passed out, I said goodbye. I thought I was dying. I said goodbye to my mother, goodbye to my father, and goodbye to my girlfriend that I had, that, that I wanted to marry. I figured uh, I'm gonna go, go someplace, maybe to heaven, I hope. <laughs> Somebody grabbed my leg and pulled me out from under the dead corpsman and put me on a landing craft 
to take me, it was a Higgins boat this time, to take me to uh, a ship, any ship, I guess, that's out there that would receive uh, wounded people. And the landing craft was hit by machine gun bullets or something from the Japanese. They uh, put holes in it and water was coming in on the bottom of the boat. And I remember I was laying face down on that boat, that Higgins boat, and it started to swallow that water. And I wanted to pull my head up out of the water and had no strength. Here again, I thought, my gosh, I'm going here, I got off Iwo, I'm off the island, going out to a ship, and now I'm gonna drown. But lo and behold, somebody grabbed me under the chin and pulled my head up out of the water. I looked, glanced over, and there was a Marine there that had one side of his face all covered up, I think an eye blown out or something, and the other eye, he's still open. He saw the, what was happening to me, and he held my head up out of the water until he got alongside the ship. So I f feel very fortunate to have had such wonderful people, brave people, and I'm here, but I feel awful sad the fact that most of them are not here. And I feel kind of bad about that. I feel bad especially about those two corpsmen. It, uh, if I hadn't yelled for that one corpsman, possibly he'd still be alive, I don't know. But the thing that really pulled me through, I think, was when I was on the ship on the fifth day, and this is where I started to remember again after being dragged on the ship and the doctor tell, told me I, I thought he was gonna lose my leg, but he told me I wouldn't. And I woke up and found myself in a body cast with my toes sticking out of both on both sides, and I think that was the first time I cried. I was so thankful to see I still had my leg, although I had already accepted the fact that I might not have it. I felt right along that I joined this man's outfit to fight, and that's what I have to do. As skinny and 122 pounds or so, 125 pounds, but I, f I figured I, I could still fight, and uh, I wanted to be part of it. So I kind of uh, kind of asked for combat, you might say. I consider myself extremely lucky, very, very fortunate. I have a lot to be thankful for. This is a wonder, I said, with all our faults that we have, and we do have some, but this is the most wonderful country in the world to live in and to fight for. And I think in this country today, we sadly need to have people better educated about our history, and especially about the wars that, that put us where we are today. There's so many people that don't appreciate that. Freedom doesn't come easy. We have to win our freedom. We have to fight for it. We have to keep it. The American flag to me means a lot. I started to say there earlier that even when I was thought I was dying, perhaps, and when I came out of, of uh, ether, when they finally put me in a body cast after Ewell, and they rolled me out on the deck of the ship, and one of the first things I saw, one of the guys, one of the ambul ambulatory type patients on the deck of the ship yelled out, hey, look, they're putting the flag up on Sarabachi. And I looked up there in, in that distance, and I saw that flag go up. Once again, big tears rolled down my eyes because I figured, well, we've won that battle, you know, and it made me feel so good. Because it's not the flag. The flag's a piece of cloth when you come down to it. It's what it represents. It, it represents our country, our freedom, everything, as far as I'm concerned. So it has tremendous value. I think of Spradlin, I think of Scarati, I think of uh, Mann and uh, all these other guys that I joked with and uh, trained with, and they're all dead now. They were killed in action. They didn't even get a chance to live their young adult life. And uh, if I can help in any way at all, if I'll do it.